80% of Alzheimer's patients have type 2 diabetes. 80% have type 2 diabetes. I'm going to rephrase that. If you have type 2 diabetes, you have a 60% chance of getting Alzheimer's disease. Now, I'm willing to bet there isn't a person in this room that knows somebody that has diabetes. They're talking about a disease that has over 400 million people worldwide today. In the next 20 years, it's going to balloon to up to 600 million people worldwide. 90% of those diabetics are type 2. 34% of them will develop diabetic retinopathy. So I'm going to repeat this again. 60% are at risk of losing their minds. 30% will lose their sight. Losing your mind, losing your sight. These are the two most frightening things that any one of us could face as we age. Now, looking at that, it makes sense that why don't we address this at the pre-diabetic stage? Well, according to the US CDC, you have around one out of three adults that actually are pre-diabetic, but even more frighteningly, nine out of 10 don't even know they have it. That means that there's a big chance that they'll develop into full-blown diabetes when it's too late. And now you understand that there's a 60% chance that all those people have a chance of getting Alzheimer's disease. And you're talking about a disease that actually has no cure. They're talking about over 40 million people worldwide. If you have uh, Alzheimer's or a loved one that has Alzheimer's, there's very little your doctor can do for you today. You'll go to your doctor and they'll probably recommend some sort of symptoms-based drug that's probably going to last nine to 10 months until it's completely ineffective. After that, you go back to them and all they can do is coach you and your family about how to deal with the disease until the day you die. That's about it. You're talking about a disease that has grown worldwide. It's one of the most expensive diseases out there. You're talking about billions of dollars, trillions of dollars in social costs, patient costs, and societal costs. It's now going from an epidemic into a global crisis. Now, I am the CEO of a biotech company called Amelex, and we've actually spent uh, the last few years working on a technology that's con been conceived maybe around 18 years ago. 18 years into R&D, and it centers around a technology that removes a thing called beta amyloids from the body. We'll talk about that. But on the journey of finding a treatment for Alzheimer's, there's two prevailing questions. How? And when? How do you treat this disease? And when is the best time to treat this disease? So if we were to wage a war on Alzheimer's, the enemy would be beta amyloids. And the battlefield would either be in the brain or in the blood. Now, beta amyloids are actually part of a normal cellular function. You actually produce these right now. Everybody in this room has beta amyloids. Your body's making them. They're not an enemy at first. They're actually quite friendly. What ends up happening is your body will produce them, and they'll get processed. They'll get disposed of as waste. But over time, as their health is compromised for a number of reasons, they actually begin to come together. Then they look like something else. The body can't seem to get rid of them. They start to build up. They morph. They evolve. They turn into something extremely deadly, lethal. So understanding this battle, let's take a look at the first battlefield, the brain. Now this makes sense. Over 100 years ago, when Alzheimer's was first scientifically discovered, they sliced up the brain and they actually saw beta amyloids and tangles inside, as plaques inside the brain. Now this makes sense. Since then, drug companies have rushed building, uh, creating vaccines, uh, antibodies, anything to actually attack the plaques in the brain. We see plaques in the brain. That person is sick. Let's get rid of the plaques. Very logical, right? And billions of dollars have been spent trying to attack these plaques in the brain. It's kind of like they built antibodies like, like little soldiers. And the soldiers have, have these loaded guns ready to attack beta amyloids as soon as they find them. 
But you see, with that approach, these soldiers aren't always the best. They're not the best trained, so they hit other things. They have, in the war terminology, collateral damage. Collateral damage translates into side effects. And these side effects have caused the numerous, numerous trials, failure after failure, to actually, to actually been a very devastating result for Alzheimer's research for the last decade and a half, last 20 years, really. It's been very difficult. So the battlefield in the brain is tough. Let's look at the blood. You see, hope is not lost. While the battle in the brain took place, there, was, there were researchers around the world, including our own, and we were studying the enemy. And what did we learn about the enemy, these beta amyloids? Well, what you're seeing right now is actually a beta amyloid pathology. You see, they start out as single beta amyloids that are floating around your blood, like you have right now. They're, your body's getting rid of them. Over time, for a number of reasons, they begin to come together. Now, this is the stage where they become the plaques. Now, as plaques, we already just heard that they attacked this first and it really wasn't working. What we learned was when they were actually coming together and still floating around the body, coming in, you know, moving between the brain and the body with, through the blood-brain barrier, it's actually causing a tremendous amount of damage. So how do we know beta amyloids are significant? I'm going to show you, I'm going to share with you an experiment that actually was published just recently. And what they did was they took two mice. Now you'll learn something interesting here. The mouse on the left is what you call a transgenic mutated mice. This is a data, I'm sorry, this is a uh, mutated, it's an engineered mice that's actually designed to get Alzheimer's disease. They produce a version of beta amyloid that looks like what you and I have, a human-based beta amyloid. It has one job in life, to get Alzheimer's. They have to do this because, believe it or not, mice and rats are one of the few mammals on Earth that do not get Alzheimer's. For example, I'm, and I'll say this right now, it's sad, but even your pets, little doggies, beagles have a high rate of, of getting Alzheimer's disease. And almost every other mammal gets Alzheimer's except mice and rats. So what do they do? They did a uh, procedure called parabiosis, which is basically they stuck two mice together. They opened up a piece where they actually shared a portion of their blood. They stitched them together. Consider it like a live transfusion. And what happened? The mouse on the left did exactly what was expected. It actually developed full-blown Alzheimer's. Beta amyloids were being shared in the blood, but here's the crazy part. The mouse developed on the right developed Alzheimer's anyway. We're talking about a mouse that cannot naturally develop this disease, but got the disease just by sharing the blood of a mouse that produced beta amyloids in the blood. Well, that's a pretty significant situation right there. Oh, let me go back here. So, well, in the beginning of this presentation, I talked about diabetes and Alzheimer's. I talked about the link. Well, if there is such a link, then technically speaking, you should be able to scientifically reproduce that, right? So enter the story of Peter's rabbits, as you saw. I call it Peter's rabbits because there's a study in 2012 that was published by our chief scientist. His name is Dr. Fredericks. And as I told you that the, uh, that the mice had a problem of developing Alzheimer's naturally, he used rabbits. Rabbits make sense because if you're going to test how a disease goes from one to the other, then logically you have to use an animal that naturally gets the disease on their own, right? And so what did he do? He took a bunch of rabbits, screwed with their insulin, increased their blood sugar. In essence, he gave the rabbits diabetes. But here's the result. Left untreated, 90% of the rabbits developed full-blown Alzheimer's disease. Even more interesting was that the link between diabetes and Alzheimer's and beta amyloids became very apparent. During the diabetic stage, the severity of the diabetes actually matched the beta amyloid pathology. Translation, diabetes triggered the creation of the very protein that, that causes Alzheimer's disease. Now let's take this insight because this very study you're looking at right now if you do a little Googling, this actually helped to fuel the notion that Alzheimer's disease 
is a form of diabetes of the brain. So let's take a look at what we just saw here. Diabetes leads to a pathway of beta amyloid, beta amyloid pathology, that leads to Alzheimer's disease, right? We saw how the amyloids would build up and come together and then get bigger and bigger, and eventually it leads to that. Well, beta amyloids have this thing against neurons. They, they, they interfere with neuronal uh, synapses, the neuronal function even kills them. But you see, your brain isn't the only place where there's neurons. For example, it can affect the eye. Your retina, or retinopathy, your, is actually called the neural retina. That's the part of your eye where the light bounces off and you can actually see an image, right? This can affect the eye. It can affect the muscles, diabetic myopathy. You're talking about uh, when you want to move your hand to pick up an object. Your brain sends a signal that travels down a wire from your spine all the way down to the muscle, telling it what to do. But those are neuronal networks, so beta amyloids can actually interfere with now your, your muscle signaling, your brain signaling. So here's a concept. We know this happens, and it leads to this. Now researchers have come forth that have done previous studies, and they've actually said, you know what, our, our antibodies, our research, our studies in these in our, our drugs that we developed, they failed because we tested on patients when they were too late. Too much has, been, has died. Uh, they're too far gone. It was too late, and they're too far gone. That's a very logical reasoning. And at the same time, we know today that the pathology of Alzheimer's actually begins 10 to 20 years before the first symptoms appear. And that's usually around the age of 65. That means there's a, if there was a way to prevent or, inter, or uh, uh, avoid this disease, it can actually happen as early as in someone's mid-40s. So I'm going to throw out a concept. What if we can disrupt the disease process? We don't know who is at risk with Alzheimer's all the time and there's billions of people on the planet. There's diagnostics that are being developed and tested nowadays, but still a ways out. But here's one thing we do know. After understanding this, we know that diabetes left untreated, unchecked, has a high rate of developing into Alzheimer's disease. And the middle step is beta amyloid pathology. What if we can intercept? What if there was a way to know early enough where we can remove these beta amyloids from the blood and actually filter it out, but not early enough before it becomes too late to actually treat the disease? What if you can prevent the disease altogether? Now here's an even bigger question. What if the technology to do just that was already here? So, at this point, I'm going to make an introduction. My journey into all, so my journey into all this actually began when I first met this man. His name is Dr. Stanley Stein. I met Dr. Stein as a teenager. This is Barbara, his wife. She was actually my English high school teacher. This is their son, Andy, my high school classmate. We're the same age. Now, they lived in the same neighborhood, so I would actually frequent their house. So imagine me as a young teenager, and I'm talking with these guys. We're talking life, philosophy, science. I mean, I actually had a really uh, interesting childhood. I had a wonderful influence in my life. Now, since then, I've developed businesses, I've traveled the world, I've done those things. But a decade and a half later, I find myself working on the very mission that this man started. At that time, I had no idea that he would actually change my life. And he's most likely going to change yours as well. Let's find out how, but before we do that, I'm going to throw with you a concept. It's called the sync hypothesis. So basically, I get asked all the time, well, you're talking about beta amyloids that, you know, they're from the brain and they go into the blood. How do they relate? So the easiest way to explain this is, uh, is alcohol. When you drink alcohol, your alcohol molecules actually go from your mouth to your blood, and they end up in your brain. You're, you're intoxicated. After a while, you go to the bathroom, and an equilibrium takes place. You release the alcohol from your body, and the alcohol levels uh, drop from your brain to maintain that balance. 
This is in sync and equilibrium concept, right? So what did Dr. Stein do? A decade and a half ago, Dr. Stein and a team of researchers, they basically went and developed a new approach to Alzheimer's. At the time, the popular research was vaccines, uh, antibodies. Th that was the trend at the time. But he didn't seek to discover an answer. Rather, he chose to invent one. So I'm going to show you how this works. These are the beta amyloids. The, I told you that they actually they have an affinity to one another. They stick really well together. So they were able to identify the sequence, the little white box there, that actually made them stick to one another the most, the stickiest part of the amyloids. They were able to synthetically replicate that and put that into a molecular structure that acted like a super magnet just for these beta amyloids. And it was tested. So let's look at the animal studies. As you can see, the, there was a point in the actual animal studies where we took a mouse where we knew that it actually developed Alzheimer's. Like I told you before, these are genetically engineered mice. One job, get Alzheimer's, right? Before they developed full-blown Alzheimer's, a point in their development was selected. They intervened. They took that molecule, and they did, the molecule did one thing. It took out the beta amyloids from the blood. Not the brain, the blood. That's all it did. This is a brain slice. The treated mice, as you can see, have no little brown dots. That's actually beta amyloid plaques. That's the one that they were trying to attack in the first place, right? The normal mice, the, 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 the ones that were not treated, did their job. They developed Alzheimer's, and there's a brain slice there of, of beta amyloids all over the place. Good, bad. But even more interesting was the other data points. 100% stopped the progression of Alzheimer's disease, 100% gained weight, and 100% had zero side effects. How is this possible? Right? This, is a, this is a monumental data point. Let's talk about gaining weight. We, already see, we can already see from the brains that it stopped the disease. But what about gaining weight? You see, these mice were designed to get sick, but sick mice don't gain weight, they lose weight, right? The fact that they gained weight actually shows that this model created an intervention point so successful that they actually were, they actually became healthy again. These, these mice that were designed to get sick got healthy. Now eventually, this technology was packaged into something that human beings can use. So at this point, is it gonna start? We actually, I'm gonna look at this right now, and we chose a, dialysis system. So we took the molecule and married it into a hemodialysis system. Now hemodialysis, it's a very common procedure, right? The blood goes out of your body, it gets filtered out, and then it goes back in as a clean blood. Now this makes sense. But ours is a little different. Actually, let me uh, rewind there. Could you, uh, all right, could you play that? So what's happening here? We introduced the molecule into the dialysis machine. But it's on the, it's on the outside of these straws, and that's where the blood actually flows through. The, the straws have little holes in them where uh, it's too small for the blood cells to go out and too small for the molecule to go in. But sm just right for these little beta amyloids to come out. As the beta amyloids actually come out, it gets stuck to this unique molecule, and it acts like a a super magnet for beta amyloids. And what's interesting is it's only for beta amyloids. The result here is a technology that has actually been shown to remove 90% of the soluble beta amyloids in the blood in the first hour. There's nothing like this, ladies and gentlemen, right? And what we're talking about here is that the model of developing a treatment for Alzheimer's disease or beta amyloid reduction, because really that's what we're talking about. I'm not even talking about Alzheimer's. I'm not even talking about retinopathy. We're talking about stopping beta amyloid pathology before it gets really bad, right? And we have a, that means we have a new weapon in the, in the war against Alzheimer's. And we didn't do it with a drug. 
We didn't do it with an antibody. In fact, it doesn't even go in the body. We did it with a nanomolecular medical device. A medical device. Medical devices are synonymous to things like, like, a, like, a, like a, a heart valve or a Band-Aid. But we're using nanomolecular technology as our approach here. Now, the technology and the treatment that you just saw has not yet been fully tested in humans in terms of its efficacy against Alzheimer's. Testing for Alzheimer's takes a long time. So we're still in the middle of human trials, and that's still a ways out. We can't yet boast of any true therapeutic treatment. However, we're talking about a technology that is proven now to actually remove a toxin from the body. It does it in a very specific way, meaning it can't actually bind to anything else. It's very targeted. And the third thing is that it does it without ever putting a new molecule inside the body. Because of this, a pathway opened up. That is why, ladies and gentlemen, it is my deep pleasure to announce today that of all the countries that we work in, the Philippines, as of early this year, has become the first country to FDA approve the very first high-speed beta amyloid reduction technology. So please applaud with me. Congratulations, <laughs> Philippines. I can't tell you how excited I am for when the world actually will experience this procedure. And I'm extremely glad that the Philippines is the place where this new breakthrough will come out. As a Filipino, I know that we culturally respect our elders. We care for them. The fact that Filipino doctors and nurses are known around the world for their, you know, their warmth, their empathy, their positive attitude, it makes the country perfect to invite and care for the world's aging population. The future is promising, ladies and gentlemen. And so, Dr. Stein, he couldn't be here today. He's actually in New Jersey right now at home, and he's been battling Parkinson's disease. My wife, uh, not my wife, but his wife, Barbara. <laughs> his wife, Barbara, my old high school teacher, my old friend, passed away only a few years ago. So I really wish she was here to experience this. I want you to think about what it means for a scientist to have worked all their lives on something so special and so amazing. And to have this milestone come along. So I'd like everybody to share with me a moment. Around a, a few weeks ago, I actually flew halfway around the world just to share this message with Dr. Stein. And you're going to share this moment with me. So please stand up. And let's share this moment when he first learned of this monumental achievement. Let's give him a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Dr. Stein, for your genius and your miraculous invention, we thank you all. We thank you. Congratulations to us all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.